speak to each of us in the name of Jesus. Inspire us, encourage us, spur us on, challenge us if necessary, Father. But all because we know, because you love us and you want the very best for us and your body. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we looked at communion, the Eucharist, what it really means. Can we remember one of the key things we learned from last week? This bodes well. This happens every week at the moment. That means there's something very seriously wrong with my teaching, which I'm hoping not the case. Thank you. It's not just about you, it's about the others in the room. It's not about you, it's who's in the room with you. I titled the sermon last week, Love Your Body. Your body not being you, it being the church, your fellow brothers and sisters, and how when we take communion, what that was about, respecting the body, honouring the body, being part of the body. That was Love Your Body. Do you remember it now? good. Who was actually here last week? Now you're all going to guiltily. Okay. Being disrespectful for the body of Christ, i.e. the church, is clearly very wrong. And before we think it happens all on from the outside, it happens from the inside as well. So what we're going to do this morning, well, we're going to look at chapter 12. Now, I actually was saying earlier on to somebody this week, uh, I believe it was uh, John Batham, I said, oh, I want to do 12 and 13. And because the passion behind doing 12 and 13 is actually chapters 12, 13 and 14 are actually a sandwich. Do you remember the last time there were some chapters in the letter that they look like a sandwich? uh, It's the way the style of writing is done. You'll discover as you read the Bible more and more that actually it's not just what is written that conveys the message, but how it's written. Our English translations are not the best in the world. Uh, There's one uh, line within the Bible that says, um, Christ is in me and I am in Christ. It actually doesn't. In the English version, it says, Christ is in me, and I am in... No, I got it wrong way around now. I am in Christ, Christ is in me. In the Greek version, Christ is at the beginning, and the word for Christ is at the end of the sentence. The idea is it sandwiches the fact that Christ is the overall lord the alpha and the omega in the english we very much make it look like us and it's not the way it's written is to say christ is primary he's at the beginning and he's at the end but when it's translated christ is at the beginning but the i the me is at the end which is wrong it's not what's trying to be conveyed so it's not just what is written but how it's written conveys the message so in this case in one corinthians where um Paul is trying to convey something, he's written it in a sandwich style. Chapters and verses weren't there. It was one whole long letter. But when you break it down, you can see that he created a sandwich. And chapter 13 is the the meat. It's the core thing of what he's trying to get at. So what I wanted to do was take chapter 12, take us into 13 today, and leave you with that connection between the two chapters And then chapter 14 was sort of emphasising something and wrapping it all up in one big meaty sandwich. So if you don't like meat, I'm sorry. And that's the idea. So it's not just what, it's how. But unfortunately, we're not going to do that today because we'd rush it and we'll ignore summer 12. And I did say to John, I wasn't sure yet. And by the time I started looking at it, I thought, no, we'll just do 12. We will. I will ask you to go out today considering chapter 13 as a connection to chapter 12, okay? Chapter 13 is fantastic. It's all about love. And it's all used at weddings. Problem is, that's great on one level, but it's taking that whole chapter out of context of what it's actually about. It's true. Love is all those things it says in 13, but you need to connect it to 12 and 14 and connect it to the whole of the Corinthian letter, okay? Okay? So I'm just alluding to the fact that when you leave today, you'll be leaving with that sort of thought in your mind about chapter 13, but not in the way you're probably expecting. So 
So, let's read chapter 12, verse 1 to chapter 11. Again, we use the New Living Translation, which is up here. So, now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshipping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives, an, gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts He alone decides which gift each person should have. Well known. We talk about it a lot uh, here, about gifts and that whole part of being body of the Christ, by being part of the body of Christ. So, in verse 1, we see the word... Special abilities by the Spirit. Others will see spiritual gifts in their translation. And that's how most of us seem to know it. But actually, most commentators would agree that the Greek grammar that's being used, it does, Paul means spiritual things. The English translation of gifts narrows it down far too quickly. Paul really doesn't use the grammar related to gifts until we get to chapter 14, verse 1. So here he's really trying to spread the net wide in what he's saying about spiritual things. Even spiritual abilities, he's probably not quite sort of getting the nuance correctly, but it's not far off. It's, it's probably better at the moment than spiritual gifts. Okay, There's a reason for this. The Corinthians have been involved prior to becoming Christians in spiritual activity. It's not only God who's involved in spiritual activity. They were worshippers of multiple idols. They would have gone to different gods for different issues and answers to their problems. Hmm, doesn't sound very much different from our world today, does it? There would have been, and is today, spiritual activity involved. There would have been actual active spiritual moments happening. But the spirit behind the activity would not have been God. So the problem is, in writing this moment about spiritual abilities, is that their previous experience of spiritual matters had left the Corinthian church poorly prepared and poorly using spiritual gifts and spiritual activity. The gifts that they'd been given by the Holy Spirit, they were misusing. They were... Now, I want us to be careful what I mean by that, and it's going to be a bit difficult to explain. But they almost misunderstood what the idea, well, they did misunderstand the idea of what it meant to have spiritual abilities, why God had dished them out. 
because of their experience previously. So they weren't very well versed in spiritual matters. They thought they were. They've experienced the spirit. They understand the spirit. You know, they know the spiritual world. But the problem was they hadn't quite understood it in the matter of being a Christian, in the matter of how God originally intended it. With me so far? They were almost over-spiritualizing everything. Problem is, I've got to say, in the last couple of hundred years, years especially here in the west we sort of tend to under spiritualize matters i know that other nations and other countries very much connected with the spiritual world very much sort of not reveling that's not the right phrase but you fully you know more open to it that's the phrase i'm looking for because you will actually understand there is definitely spiritual matters behind everything the spiritual world behind everything here in the West, because of great that thing called enlightenment, science will have all the answers. We sort of pin down everything to it must have an answer. Two plus two equals four. Glad I did me maths then, all right. And so we actually rationalize everything. But in the last 20 years or so with postmodernism, I've got to say people searching now for spiritual significance we have to be careful that we don't overreact to rationalism by over-spiritualizing everything else. Looking for a demon under every rock. Or looking for God and saying something good has come my way, it had to have come from God. Let me define that. We agree that all blessings come from our Lord. Amen? Okay. But the issue is sometimes some things come our way, good things, we think is a good thing, and we think, great, God has answered something for me. Actually, that wasn't God's answer. And actually, that later on, that good thing that came, we will discover has actually ensnared us and trapped us. So it's not all from God. So we have to be very cautious sometimes when we say, this has come from God. God has answered this prayer. More than likely has. But we just have to sometimes be cautious, and we'll come to that later on. So we don't want to look for a demon under every rock, and we don't want to sort of say everything good has actually come from God. Good is in inverted commas, by the way, on my piece of paper here, okay? Because I believe everything good has come from God. So we have to be cautious, always. And I'm going to be re-emphasizing this later on. But I do think that some of us, I include me in this, need to shake out of the rationalism. We need to see our eyes a little bit more aware of the spiritual realm that's going on. Verse 3. I just want to touch on this for a minute. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Huh? What does Paul mean? If you want the honest truth, actually we don't fully know what he exactly meant and why the context of that particular sentence or what meant to the church then. We probably think it's a bit of Paul's rhetoric to guide their thinking as he goes forward. By the way, this is not an acid test to discover whether somebody is a Christian or not. Watch the movie about Jesus? Ever watch the actor go, Jesus is Lord? But actually they know nothing about Jesus themselves, they're just acting. We can all say Jesus is Lord, yes? So it's not an acid test. Do you know what I mean by acid test, I hope? Good. It's not an acid test to prove that somebody, and even if somebody says Jesus be cursed, I find it very hard for a Christian to say that out loud. I can say sometimes having a go at Jesus and being really upset with Jesus because we think that he's allowing something to happen that shouldn't. But this is not that sort of test here. Back in Paul's time, to turn around and say that Jesus is Lord really did need the power of the Holy Spirit behind you. Because the minute you confess that Jesus is Lord, that's it. You're up for death. Caesar is Lord in their culture. 
So to say that, there's probably a very strong possibility here that Paul is making a point of saying, those who say openly and confessionally that Jesus is Lord, they've got to be doing that with the strength of the Spirit to give them the courage to do that. Do you, do you see the point? And probably in the context of them being pagans originally, he's sort of saying, well, you would have said, Jesus be cursed, because you wouldn't have had the Spirit to drive you to that point to go against the crowd, to know that you're offering your life up the minute you say, Jesus is Lord. We don't have that problem in this country. But there are other brothers and sisters around the world who have that problem. If they say Jesus is Lord, they're offering up their lives at that moment. So I don't want to take it as an acid test. That's very clear. We can't do that. And to make the connection to chapter 13, to live one's life as Jesus as Lord is displayed by what is described in chapter 13. That'll all make sense when we go to chapter 13 in August. So, four to six. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Paul here is emphasizing the oneness of God. Therefore, the oneness of the church. I said to you earlier on, the church, pre before the Christians that are in Corinth, before they were Christians, would go to different gods for different problems. Here, Paul is saying, there is one God, he's the only one person that you go to for all your different reasons, and he will give you as is necessary. There is a oneness here. And he's also emphasizing something else. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. I'm just going to, because we're going to be looking at gifts and how the body works, it might be helpful for us just to understand slightly how God works. The unknowable, the knowable God, but not completely knowable God, I'm just about to not fully explain to you, but explain as best as I can. It's called a great word called Trinitarian theology. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We all recognize that he, the one God, but three persons of the Godhead. Are you with me so far? So he's of the same substance, i.e. he is God, but he's three different persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They function, they're, they're God singular, but they function within the Godhead differently. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago I explained the fact there was never not the Father, there was never not the Son, there was never not the Holy Spirit. They were always that. Because there was a Son, there was a Father. Because there was a Father, there was a Son. You remember that, yeah? Okay. So, here we have is that the Father is sort of not the head of God, and this gets confusing, but bear with me. Well, let me start with the sun. It makes life easier, actually, for me. You have the sun. The sun is the only God, part of the Godhead who could come down, die on the cross, be raised to life, and intercedes for us for the Father. The Father doesn't do that. The Son does that. The Holy Spirit has his function, and one of these key functions is to distribute the gifts to all of us. The Father doesn't do that. The Son doesn't do that. It's the Spirit that does that. It's the Holy Spirit that resides in each and every Christian who's been baptized in Christ. Amen? Amen. Do you see what I mean? And the Father sort of does the sending, does everything. But they are not, one is not over the other. They are, all three work relationally. They all have a different function, but they're all God. Does that make sense? Is that good? That was basically Trinitarian theology in the most basic form. I could break it down for you. I took 10 lectures to get that bit. Not because I couldn't get it, but it's, it's a lot deeper now. But that will do for now. How can I try to best describe it? And there's nothing in this world that really helps 
Other than, do you know the little Chinese ivory balls uh, that you see that are carved in different layers as they go through? Do you know what I mean? I mean ivory pre-1947, I'm talking here clearly now. But do you understand what I mean? Where they intricately carve it out. Do you know what I mean? So there's a ball within a ball within a ball. And they move separately, but they are connected. It's the one piece. If you don't know, um, email me and I'll send you a link to show you. I wish I had one. That's the best way I can describe it, is that actually the balls all move independently inside the same substance. The problem is, what it doesn't work is, is that there's sort of a, a little layer, then a wider layer, then a bigger layer, and that's not how Trinitarian works. It's not like little Holy Spirit, then the Son, then God the Father encompass them. They work, they're like wibbly wobbly, they work within each other. It's relational, okay? okay done. That's Trinitarian theology in a, in a breath. The reason for that is because you need to understand that's how we are meant to function as the body of Christ. The different gifts, the different abilities as a body. And we'll come to that as we go. So Paul is trying to emphasize that, that actually it's the same God works in different ways amongst his people. Okay? Just a quick question, very quick. I said to you, he's emphasizing the oneness of God. Therefore, the oneness, by the way, of the church. But the oneness of God, and you only go to the one God for all of your answers. What, and this is a real question, I'm going to actually ask a real question today. What is our equivalent today? The Corinthians originally didn't do that, went to different gods. What is our equivalent today? If you're a visitor and you're not sure, that's a real question. I expect a hand up. You've got a problem. How do you get that answered? And be honest. Google it. Google it. Thank you. <laughs> Begins with G, but you're right. You've got money worries. Where do you go to? To bank. You go to the bank. Should go to God. You're right, Paul, huh? Wonga. You go to maybe family. You panic. So you do go to Wonga. You do go to your bank. You laugh. Well, these, these things, they, and we're not knocking just Wonga, by the way, okay? So hear me carefully before we get sued. But, you know, all of these things, we was watching it yesterday, it was one... Representative, 1,295% APR. I have no idea what that means to me, but I know it's high. Right? And that's just ridiculous. And people do. They go running to the bank first. And Christians do that as well. Where we're meant to go running to for our answer is first. Can we try and do that collectively? We should be running to where to first? Right. See what I mean? Sometimes we can say, oh, they've blessed me. They've given me a loan. This has come from God. You think I'm joking, but think about it. Has it come from God? No, potentially it hasn't. Because you're ensnared in, 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 yeah. And also with family, or you've got family issues, and you want people to resolve it, and you, you start going to other family and friends to get them to try and resolve it for you. You forget, oh, I should pray to God first. Because you might go through that family friend, and that family friend actually is really going to hold it against you and, 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 and sort of hold it over you. Do you remember when I helped you out? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the oneness of God, you go to God for all your problems. And you go to God for loving him and praising him and everything else, not just for problems. God is not just a problem slot machine. Verse 7 to 11. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles. To another, the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another Spirit. 
Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Verse 7 alludes very clearly to the reason why spiritual abilities, spiritual gifting exists. And it's quite frankly what I've been banging on about for numerous Sundays by now. And it got mentioned earlier on by Marcy. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. It's not about you, but who's in the room with you. Spiritual gifts are not there for us to look good. They're not there to prove that we have been approved by God. They are for the encouragement, and a big word, the edification, which is almost the same word, of the other person or others in the room. That's what spiritual gifts are about. Be they a Christian, be they part of the body or not, or be they somebody who doesn't know Christ yet, you might be given a word for them. And various other things, but we'll come to that and pin those down, uh, not today, but another time. But that is the primary reason for spiritual gifts. The list that Paul breaks down there is not exhaustive. In other of Paul's letters, there's others that he mentioned. And again, you could put the ones in Paul's letters plus these ones, and it's still not fully exhausted yet. There are multiples. And we'll note in chapter 14 that it's prophecy and speaking in tongues which Paul then concentrates on. He's building up to an argument, remember? Chapter 14 is sort of the end of the sandwich. So at the moment, all we're doing is biting through the first bit of bread. So you're never going to eat sandwich quite in the same way again. So actually, we realize that Paul here is overemphasizing. Uh, he eventually overemphasizes the, uh, the gift of unlearned spiritual language, known commonly as just tongues. Because it would appear that the Corinthians believe they are over-abusing the use of tongues. They want to be spiritual people and they see therefore then using the gift of tongues and the ability to do so means you're approved by God, means you're a spiritual person and um, it's almost the pinnacle of being a spiritual person. Okay? And he's trying to sort of knock that understanding out. And I will say this here and now, that is almost very similar to certain churches around the world today who believe that unless you're speaking in tongues, they teach, unless you speak in tongues, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a word I'm looking for, and it's not polite, but it's basically, what a load of bunkum, what a load of junk. That is absolute rubbish. There is heresy, you're absolutely right. So hear me carefully. Not having the gift of being able to speak in tongues does not mean you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Did everybody get that? Good. I know I do, but you know, I didn't for the first 15, 16 years of my Christian walk. Okay? I think God deals with more issues because tongues... And we'll come to that later, but just let me just leave it to that. So Paul is tackling this for now. He's correcting their understanding. So he's putting tongues. Remember I said about the way he writes, emphasizes something? He puts tongues at the end of each list to emphasize something to them, saying, you got it wrong. Notice here in this, he says, um, to the one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. He's put that right at the top counterbalances tongues underneath. Why? Well, you think about it. If you've got wisdom, you'll have wisdom in how to use the gifts. You'll actually understand that tongues is not the top pinnacle of life. It's the way he's written it, okay? 
So it's to balance it out. And you'll notice what's in the middle in a minute because I want to emphasize that. So just point that out to you. So quite frankly, if you've had some damage done to you in the past, and I, I've over the years I have spoken to people who have had real damage done to them um, because they, not from within here I hope, but because they believe that because they don't speak in tongues, they clearly are not filled with the Holy Spirit. That is an absolute load of rubbish. Okay? Have you got that? Yes. <clears throat> Good. <clears throat> Moving on. This is the, the gift I want to emphasize today. And this is right in the middle of this really, really long sentence. I've got to say, if I'd done this in one of my dissertation papers, in one of my um, theological papers, a sentence this long, I would have been marked down for too long. But we're not worried about that for now. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak unknown language, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It's four there, but the key one is actually the ability to discern the spirits. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 16. I'm not going to put it up. I just want you to hear me. Acts chapter 16, 16 to 18. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Sounds good, doesn't it? I ain't got to do a message at the moment. She's telling everybody who they are. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of our Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. The rest of the story you can read later on. That particular example is an example of how truth may not actually be from God. It, ha it is true. They were telling people how they can be saved. And it was all true. But actually, there was a demonic influence behind it. And therefore, what does that mean? There was a demonic reason behind it. It was true. But what was behind it was a lie and false. It had other reasons. So you with me? So in light of this, we have to be discerning of the spirit that is behind things. Just because it sounds good doesn't necessarily mean that it is. It's very key. And here especially, and the reason that Paul sort of done it in the way he's done it in this letter, is in regards to prophetic words. That's why here we have within this church congregation, we have the practice of testing a word before it's delivered. That's why we say here, please come to the leadership team first so that we can help you discern the word. Now, I'm not saying it's only the leadership team who have the ability to discern between spirits. Hear me carefully. Because not all of us have that as well. We all have different giftings. But the point is, on a Sunday morning, a cent central Sunday morning as a gathered church, it is the responsibility of the leaders of this church to care for the flock. It is the responsibility, God-given responsibility, for us to ensure that no damage is done to you via other things on a Sunday morning. It's, I mean, it's our responsibility. It's all our responsibility for each of us. That's everybody here all through the week. But on a Sunday morning, clearly, that is one element that we can help in not causing that damage. So that is why we say, come to us. Allow us to help ensure that it has come from God. Because I will say this. You could be a Christian, it, and I don't believe that Christians are 
can be demonically possessed, but we can have an overarching influence. Demons can have an influence on us that we don't understand. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. Just bear with us. Because um, messages, anything, can come from three spirits. We see that in the Bible. It can come from three potential spirits. God, demonic. Do you know what the other one is? Flesh, human spirit. So we always have to be aware and want to, just because something sounds good and sounds godly and sounds true, doesn't always mean it is. That's why it says, test the spirits. 1 Thessalonians, which I'm just going to read to you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22. I tag these deliberately just to save me grief. It says very clearly, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Amen. Should be an amen. Do not scoff at prophecies. Amen. But test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. This is Paul speaking to the Thessalonican Thessalonicans, and test everything. Don't stifle, allow the spirit to flow. But you know, good practice, and let's be honest, in our government today, we're into good practice. Good practice is to get it tested first. It's better that it's tested over here than done up the front and causing damage. That's why we hold to the practice that we do. And this is not just related to prophecy. The spirit can come in all walks of our life. It's very easy, and I include myself in this, to read something, to believe something's of God, but actually it's not. It's really my own desires. I was funny enough, I was reading one of the uh, London Baptist Association leaders wrote to, this week. He was saying, do you know, I start off, I've got a problem that's come. I start off talking to God, being very spiritual about it, really want to work on it. Then I start realizing I'm finding a human answer to the problem. This makes sense. This is logical. This is whatever else. And actually... It's not. It's our understanding and work something out, not God's. So you have to go to trusted friends, trusted brothers and sisters in Christ. Come to us. Not just on a Sunday morning, come to me. I have people come to me and want to ask, do you think this is of God? Is this the right answer? We discuss it around and hear the spirit together. That's testing the spirits. But, verse 11, it is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. It's the Spirit that dishes them out. Not the pastor, not the decision of the leadership team. It's God. If you've been given a gift by God, that, the gift that he's given you, that's how he wants you to operate within the body. It's no look good being jealous after somebody else's gifts. It's almost, I feel like sometimes we can really desperately want other people's gifts. I would, certain gifts I can look at in other people, I went, I wished I could have that. But I almost feel like then I'm a kid who wants somebody else's present. If God's ordained you to have that gift and not the other one, there is a reason. Okay, I'm now going to read verses 12 to 26. And I'm going to ask a real question. And the question is, what does this passage say to you? Ready? Ready? Yes. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit yes the body has many different parts not just one part if the foot says i am not a part of the body because i am not a hand that does not make it any less a part of the body and if the ear says i am not part of the body because i am not an eye would that make it any less a part of the body if the whole body were an eye how would you hear 
Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it were had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honourable are those we clothe with greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. While the more honourable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honour and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for the harmony among the members, so that all members care for each other. Verse 25. That's to us. If one part suffers, all the parts suffers with it. And if one part is honoured, all the parts are glad. What does this passage say to you? It says we are all one family and we need each other. We're, we're not standalone. We're, we're, we're part of each other. Um, we fit to get... The body is... All of us, and, and, and often we think of ourselves as a body that, that misses the mark. Um, that you can't do it all by yourself. When? We can't do it on our own. We need each other. Okay. I'm coming all the way around. Now, why I'm here, if there's anybody else here who wants to make a comment. That we've all got to do our bit, because if um, one of us isn't doing what we should be doing, then um, our body's not functioning properly. Thank you. Don't put your hands up. Especially you, Barry. The chain is as strong as its weakest point. Thank you. The chain is strong as its weakest point. Okay. We all, we all have a role to play. Thank you. Okay. Very true. The whole of 1 Corinthians, or part of its key message, is about unity of the body. And here in this particular part, I agree that everybody has a part that is important in the body. And everybody has a role to play. But this morning, especially the message I think God wants us to sort of pull out, is about discerning between the spirits. It's about recognising that we actually all don't hear God on our own, or clearly. You'll get that when we get to 14. You'll see that it talks about the fact that um, we see everything partially we don't know everything even when a prophecy is delivered for instance we only know in part whoever's got that bit of prophecy only sees it in part so i just thought i'd say that so i want to pull out something you may not understand we're going to come to about our role and our function in a moment and this is something that really sort of came to me as i was preparing this and i hadn't quite seen this before but rheumatoid arthritis you wasn't expecting that quote Some of you will know, and some of you will know, not know, that I had it for seven odd years. Our uh, child was about two years old, and then I got it full-blown, racked from head to toe in pain. I don't have it now, praise God. Got taken away about ooh, four years ago now, it's coming up for. And I just want to just explain as best as I can, and if you're a doctor or a nurse in here and you know this a lot better than I do, just bear with me. Rheumatoid arthritis, they don't fully quite know exactly how it happens, but they know this much. A foreign body tricks, so something from outside, something that's not part of the body, tricks one part of the body 
the immune system, into believing that another part of the body that actually has a very wide influence, i.e. the saline in between your joints. It's got a technical name and I haven't got a clue. And, but you know all the bit that keeps your joints nice and supple? You know when you crack? Actually proves you've got less saline in than you should have, all right? So, so don't crack. <laughs> but it tricks... RA effectively tricks, this foreign part of the body tricks the immune system into believing that the saline is not actually part of the body. It is alien and a dangerous part of the body and must be attacked. So this causes, so what happens is the immune system is always attacking the saline in between all your joints. Okay? Constant. The body is always in pain. And it causes great and untold damage to the body. The motions and the brain function of the body are always slower because of the pain. And the body becomes quite deficient and unable to function properly because of what's going on inside of it. And this is all happening because a part of the body that thinks it's doing its job has actually been tricked by an outside foreign body, let's say the devil, you're getting the analogy now I'm assuming, into believing that it is right by attacking the other part of the body that actually really is doing its job correctly. Do you get the point? My immune system thought it was doing the right job. It hadn't realized, it hadn't discerned that whatever tricked it originally, but by the way, it could have been just something as a simple cold, had actually tricked it into believing that my saline was actually part of my body. So it was attacking it all of the time. The way they treat this these days now is they suppress the tricked part of the body until it learns its lesson and stops attacking. It's painful and a very unpleasant treatment, I can assure you. They use one of the drugs, is very similar to what, uh, uh, they lower dosage of it, that they actually use to treat cancer. It makes you quite sick all of the time. I'm not wanting you to feel sorry for me, by the way, I just happened to be mentioning it in passing. So it's necessary that the body, and so this suppression, it needs to happen sometimes so that the body can function better. The body's still never functioning fully, but it is slightly better. Discerning through the spirit is sometimes we have to ensure that we haven't been tricked. And I'm saying this and I'm emphasizing this and I've not, I'm going to just say this. My brothers and sisters, we are one. We rely upon each other as one. Time is coming, I believe, that we as a church will be doing some massive things out there. But that means an attack is coming. Because the devil don't like it. And we need to make sure that our internal togetherness, we are not being tricked. That there isn't one or two of us that are tricked to believe that everybody else or, or the key thing, maybe some of the leaders or whatever else, are being are actually doing, not doing God's work. Because the immune system thought the saline was not doing its work. It was not meant to be there, so it was attacking it. We need to be able to discern between the spirits. And I think that's coming more and more and more as the months and the years are going to go on. We need to be very up for it, very aware of it, and be very cautious. It doesn't look, we're looking like for everybody going, are you tricking us? Are you, is there something wrong with you? But we have to be aware. Somebody once said, oh, Satan doesn't work very hard in Britain because really they don't acknowledge him there. And then I had somebody else and I said, no, actually, he's probably more active here because he actually has blinded a chunk of us through his existence. He's this little devil, little imp thing in red. He's blinded us through his activity. And we've blinded ourselves in the process. But he's very much at work. We need to have eyes open to what's going on. Also, one of the key lessons from this passage is that we are part of the body, all of us, and we all have a function. 
And we must all run in that function. You know, I said earlier on, don't try and steal somebody else's gifts or want that one. Don't try and infiltrate somebody else's area. Run in the gifts and the ability that God's given you. And run in them. Don't deny them. Live in them, accept them, open them, allow God to use them as part of this body. And it doesn't always mean that it's actually in here on a Sunday in this building. There could be something that you've been given a gift for that is actually more out there, but you'll have the church's support behind you. Do you understand? And there's some of us here who need to really run in those gifts. And you've been part of this church for so long, but you, you haven't been baptised. You've not become a member yet. And God wants you to run in the gifts he's got ready for you. But the body is deficient because we haven't yet got you running in those gifts. And you might sometimes think, oh, it doesn't bother if I don't turn up this Sunday or I don't turn up at this prayer meeting or I don't turn up at this meeting. So right, others are there. But you have no idea if the gift that's been given to you is key for that day. And so the body of Christ is deficient because you haven't come that day. We're missing out. The kingdom of God is missing out. Now, it's not condemnatory. It's the idea that you've got to understand that we're all important in the kingdom of God. We've all got something of value to bring. Just because it may not be seen, and I've always said this, those gifts, those people do things behind the scenes that are not seen, they're the most honourable and it's there in the passage. Just because I stand up and shout my mouth off and whatever else does not mean that I'm the most talented and gifted person in this church. It'd be the person who does it quietly behind the scenes. We are all gifted equally. Okay? Okay? So we don't want to miss out. You don't want to miss out on using the things that God has given you, do you? Do you? Only when we're singing that song, Lord, have your way. Ooh, with us. Not with me, with us. I was getting quite excited about that. I thought, yes. So if you haven't quite learned what your role is in the church today, come and see me. Come and see me. Verses 27 to 31, and this is going to be very brief. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts, note that phrase, here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles. Second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who help others, those who have gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Notice where tongues is? Right at the end. Are, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And we'll come to that in a moment. Firstly, the list. It's not a headship order. Again, it's Paul writing for a particular reason. It's a time order, effectively. Apostles back then, and today, plant churches. They're like evangelists. But apostles plant churches. Prophets then start speaking into that situation. Teachers then come along and teach, built on the foundation created by the Apostles and the prophets. Once a church is established, you'll have miracles, you'll have healing, and you need things to back up the word. And as the church grows, you're going to need helpers who can give practical assistance, yes? Teacher can't do it all. The teacher can't do it all. I just thought I'd re-emphasize this again. The teacher can't do it all. Then you need leadership who can care for the wider church. Think about Moses. He had to appoint other leaders to help with judgments, didn't he? Moses couldn't do it all. His father-in-law, Jethro, funny enough, who, wasn't, who was actually a pagan, actually suggested good wisdom. You need to appoint other judges to do this for you. 
Unknown languages are part of that timeline. Paul has put it right at the end of the list because of the damage that it is causing in that particular church context at that particular time. Clearly, the rhetorical questions. Saying, stop worrying and being jealous of other people's gifts. Exercise the gifts that you have. But then, as I said to you, this is now connected to the other piece of meat in the sandwich. But earnestly desire, verse 31, the gift that is going to edify the church, not yourself. Earnestly desire, and I'm going to show you, he says, a way of life that is best of all. And this is where we then go into chapter 13. So I want you to hold to that for a minute, okay? I'm going to pray, and now I'm going to leave you. And as you walk out, go and collect the children and leave for the week. I'm going to leave you with hopefully an abiding memory of you to think about chapter 12 actually more in light of chapter 13. Okay, so let's pray. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.